So my name is Trigvi. I work for a company called BusyWeb. We're a full service digital marketing agency. That means we do everything under the sun from building you a brand, building you a website, actually getting more people to look at it, uh, getting more people to interact with you, and actually take, pick up the phone and, uh, and uh, start working with you. Uh, the, here is uh, my name spelled out. Acceptable mispronunciations of my name are Trig V, Trig V, and now that I'm over 40, I also have a trick knee. So, <coughs> um, my parents gave it to me. Thanks for asking. It's a Scandinavian name, yes, sir. So, I'm going to be trying to go fairly fast and get to the and and uh, I'm the sizzle and the steak for 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 Larry, Jill, and Chuck. So. If you would like to get a copy of this, I'd be more than happy to give you one. Um, just let, let me know after the fact. So uh, again, we're a full service agency. We're based in Champlin. We have about 18 people as part of our team now. Um, anything under the sun digital, I said this already, so I'm going to skip ahead. So let me ask you guys a question, folks, a question. Um, raise your hand if you know the last time your website was updated. Okay, how, how about uh, when was the last time you posted to a social media channel? Okay. When was the last time you heard and interacted with a client online? Well, you don't count. <laughs> she's a client. So uh, all of these things are available to you, and that's what I'm going to spend the majority of my, my time talking about. The reason why these are important questions to have, all of you should be raising your hand and all of you should have a knowledge of when the last time you did that. Because if you don't, it doesn't mean that people aren't going to buy from you. It's that they're never even going to look at you again. This is what you're offering them. A completely empty store. And if you ever walk into a store and you have a need and you see this, what does that tell you? They're either out of business, they're underprepared, they are not in a position to be able to take my money and take, do what I need them to do. We don't have hurricanes. This was my local, this was my local rainbow. I, I, it, was, it was a football weekend. <laughs> so here's what I'm going to go, go over. As you can see, I've got a lot that I want to cover, and so I'm going to go relatively fast. I'm going to talk about what the difference between what the traditional marketing sense is and what it really is today, some basics about what your website should and shouldn't do, uh, how to write for the web, and uh, how to get more people to look at you. So in the old days, this is what they would teach you in business school, right? You spend the majority of your time prospecting, networking, going to luncheons, going to luncheon learns like this, meeting new people, hey, do you have a card, all that kind of stuff. Then you synthesize that down into you figure out who's going to be a good prospect for you, and then you're going to work even harder to try and get them to be a client. You're going to spend the least amount of your time making sure they continue to be your client, right? This is Business School 101. Everybody should know this off the top of their head, right? It's called the sales funnel. The problem is, thanks to the internet, this is completely and utterly wrong. Because now what happens is anybody who is looking for what you do will go to Google, they'll enter in a keyword, and then they'll evaluate you based on what their own predilections are. And frankly, they do not need you anymore. Because it, just by doing what I just described means that they now have a list of 100, 200, 500 people who do the exact same thing you do. This is what marketing looks like now. It's easier than ever to get prospects to come to you and prospects to start to engage to you. You're going to spend the same amount of time continuing to work with the people that are prospects and turning them into customers, but now the majority of your time needs to be spent on leveraging the existing relationships you have with the existing customer base that you have asking the people that you've already had a good relationship with to refer you to new people. If you haven't, and, <clears throat> excuse me, this, and, and why is that? It's because, again, you go to Google, and if they don't remember you, or they don't know all of your services off the top of their head, 
and they're gone. They're going to go to somewhere else. How many of you have a client base where you haven't talked to all of your clients in the last 90 days? All of you have talked to your client, every single one of your clients in the last 90 days. Perfect. Here's how the, the theory of marketing works when it comes to online engagement. This is our store, right? Some of us have an actual store, some of us have a figurative store, but all of us have a point of interaction where we start working with the public and offering something for sale. So the first thing that we have to do is provide a really wow experience. That's how we overcome that big list of people who do everything that we do, is we are genuinely interested in the people that we work with and we give them a great experience. I'll tell you this, if you cannot give your customers a good experience, Comcast is hiring. <laughs> and you should work on that before you do anything else. So, but let's say, let's say we can give everything, that guy's writing madly down, Comcast is hiring. <laughs> so we're providing somebody with a really fantastic experience. The next thing that we do is we entice them to stay in touch. We don't just say, here it is, thanks, See you later. We want to remind, ha have them reminded of the experience, and we also want some feedback. Again, the way in which we're showing how we're having people come to us is because we're likable people. And so by, in being liked, we want to have some follow-up. We want to continue the relationship. Tell me how my product helped you. Tell me how it made your life better. Tell me how you were affected and you had a better relationship with time because of my product. So after we entice people to stay in touch, we want to give them the opportunity. That's what social media is for. Tell us about it. Give us a great review online. Tell your friends about us. And when we, uh, after we entice people to stay in touch with us, we are re-engaging with them. They're coming back to us and continuing the conversation. We're offering new and interesting ways to try and get them to look at us again and re-engage in the process. And by re-engaging people in the process, that does two things. Number one, it brings people back to us to buy again. Maybe we have a complimentary product or a service that they don't necessarily needed the first time, but they do the second, third, or fourth time that we work with them. And when we re-engage them, not only does it drive people back to our store, it drives social visibility. Which is a fancy way of saying that great customer experience that you've offered somebody, you're doing that in a big, giant, crowded room. If I talk to one of, one of you in front of the entire cr cr crowd here, not only am I going to give that one person a really great experience, but then all of you are going to be able to see it. That's social visibility. And when we have social visibility in a positive form, what we end up getting then is new prospects. We've gotten our customers, we've re-engaged them, and now their friends are going to start seeing that they're having a good relationship with a local-based company. I like to call this the goggles of engagement, because if you hold your hands up like this, you can kind of see it that way. So this is the theory of digital marketing. So what I want you to do is take a minute and actually write down what is one wow experience that you can deliver that nobody else can? What is one way that you can offer value to your clients that nobody else can? And finally, here's the money. How can you, what is one way that you can engage your customer base by delivering on your promise? What do I mean by that? How many times have you seen online, I'm not wearing the microphone that I'm supposed to be wearing. Okay, you good? I'm good? Okay, good. How many times have you seen somebody send you an email saying, hey, guess what? If you take 10 minutes to fill out this, this survey, then uh, you'll be entered into a drawing to win an iPad. Right? And in theory, what's supposed to happen is you go, man, I could use a new iPad. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll give you 10 minutes of your time. Has any of you, there's like 30, 35 people in the room here, have any of you actually known anybody who won an iPad? So that's why number three is up there. Delivering on your promise means showing 
integrity even when you're offering it on a one-to-many basis. Absolutely. So they don't do that a drawing at all. Depends on the person. I always do a drawing when I offer one. And when you do a drawing, do you then post that the results that say in John Smith one that's from XYZ Corporation? Absolutely. Absolutely. So take a little time. This is a safe space if you want to share. Who's got a wow customer experience that they can deliver? Some of you are staring at me frightened. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, free will. Prepared. Free will. Some, some of us are born with it. Some of us need to go to this guy. Excellent. <laughs> Perfect. What else? Yes, sir. Well, we provide world-class service, but a chance for you to win up to $100,000 during our musical trivia contest. He's a DJ. <laughs> Good. Very successful. Good. Good. Is any, have you ever publicized whoever wins the 100 grand? Well, we haven't had a $100,000 winner, but we have $500. It's through the Minnesota State Lottery. Perfect. Perfect. Who's got another? Who's got a... What, a way that they can offer value to your members that no one else can. Cool. Are they unique? Can you offer them in a different way that nobody else can? Okay. That's okay. Perfect. Yes, sir. That's perfect. That's perfect. That's a maddeningly frightening prospect to buy a home. You have to cut open a vein and show your entire financial future right at somebody else's fingertips. And they're judgy, right? They're looking at you going, hmm, yeah, you really needed that jet ski. So having that experience where you're making somebody feel better, that's crucial and that's beautiful. Thank you all for sharing. So let's talk about your website. <clears throat> the website should be your hub of all of your digital marketing activities. If you have a website that doesn't do anything for you, you need to talk to somebody after today. Your website should be a salesperson. It should be a marketing collateral effort. It should be a leave behind. It's where people look for you first. I always do that when somebody comes in and offers me a deal that I think is too good to be true. The next thing I do as soon as they leave is I go look at their website. And if it doesn't have an effective website, if it has spelling errors, if it doesn't load correctly, if it doesn't look good on my phone, thank you, next. And that sounds harsh and that sounds judgmental, but that's really the life that we live in right now. Because people are looking for reasons not to buy from you before they learn, look for a reason to buy from you. Incorporating social media and SEO is key. These are kind of black box theories where you, it's kind of big and scary and you put money in and then maybe you get a result coming up the back end. There are some ways in which you can demystify that and the, one of the most important ways to grow your search ranking is by having a social channel, is by having a Google Plus channel. Oops. Oh. Geez, I felt like I was on a roll there too. Well, that's what happens if you're not you know, properly set up, on, set up on the internet. Right, exactly. This is what happens. See, I did that on purpose. Excellent. Your website should have a couple of things on it. It should have the ability to talk to you easily and quickly in a redundant way, meaning you should be offering many different ways to have somebody be able to contact you. Your phone number should be someplace where I don't have to go looking for it. You should have a contact form that doesn't take me forever and a day to fill out if I, if I want to send in some information. 
And if I want to just learn about you, if I want to validate a decision that I've already made by having you be part of my life already through a sales call, it should do that as well. Yes, sir. I find it very frustrating. A lot of companies um, out there tend to, when you look for contact, you know, with a phone number. Yeah. If there's no phone number, it's just send us a message type thing. It's right. Like they don't want to be found or something. Right. It just doesn't make sense. Right. And that's a perfect example. You are the kind of person who wants to call somebody on the phone. So the phone number should be readily available and, and accessible for those people that really want to, to, to be able to talk to you. Yes, sir. It's got maybe a philosophical question for you as far as marketing. Do you think with that the change of generation and the upcoming customers that they really want to call as much as the older generation? I'll, I'll tell you from, from my business, I don't think I've ever answered a phone call from a customer other than a, a salesperson. I speak to customers after they're already customers. Ninety percent of my sales is online. What is your business? It's SEO marketing. Okay. So. That's a business that's really based sort of exclusively on who you know mm -hmm. and and who you've given a good track record to. So it doesn't surprise me that people don't call you. I don't have prospects call me. That's right. Their question. They do their research, the background. They email me. Right. And, and they're going to be talking to your existing client base more than anything. All right. Are we back? Super. Next yeah. thing that's critical to have, yes, sir. Can I share something on that, too? Yes. I've been a realtor since June 1st, 1997. Okay. Just the last year, I've retooled basically all my marketing flyers and everything. It's all call slash text. Mm -hmm. So I only put my cell number on there because the millenniums, age team 18 to 34, they're more apt to look at a five minute video or text than to call you. Absolutely. So you have to go with the changes, yet you still got the, the other generation, the baby booners and beyond, they're more apt to call you and even from a landline. However, the younger they are, the more apt they're just ready to use social media, such as either Facebook, Twitter, or your texting or email. Absolutely. So that's the key, is that it really depends on your, your audience, but the important thing to keep in mind is have multiple VIN venues of communication. Even though you don't get a lot of people who are calling you on the phone, you, you still should have it because it does present a certain amount of legitimacy that you actually do have a phone number. Similarly to you, if you want people to start communicating with you, so you can't force them into communicating the way you want to be communicated to. You have to offer multiple different options. So. The next thing I want to talk about is mobile responsiveness. This is really crucial if you are in a business that has a continual need of new customers. So what this means is mobile, if, if you have a mobile responsive site, what that means is that no matter what the device that is looking at it, it will render in the same way every time. If you ever pulled up a website on your phone and it's about a quarter of an inch high, that's because the website is rendering itself in that four inch screen. It's not rendering itself differently based on the size of the screen. So the more important punchline to this is that in April of last year, Google stopped ranking websites that are not mobile responsive on a mobile search. I'll say that again because it's, it's a little convoluted. Google stopped ranking websites that are not mobile responsive for a mobile search. <coughs> so that means is that if you have a mobile if you if you have a website that is not mobile responsive and I am looking for you on my phone or on my tablet you cannot be found. And if you are good on you cuz it's probably going to go away. Yes sir. I will tell you I have mobile response and it's like <laughs> You get the business so back much faster than before. Absolutely. They're responding back immediately. And uh, so my team has that, and it's just it's phenomenal. Absolutely. There are two more things that I want to mention when it comes to this. Number, second, make sure that when you deal with your website developer, they make your website be touchscreen responsive which is a fancy way of saying if you have your phone, your, a website that's mobile responsive, and you have your phone number listed on the website, I should be able to pull out my phone and touch your phone number and then my phone should know that they need to dial the phone to dial that number. 
because I'm beginning to be an old man and I do this for a living and I if, if I have to remember a phone number after I look at it and before I pull up my phone app on my phone that's like that's like a second second and a half I, I I'm not that good <laughs> tell my ask my wife I can barely remember to do the laundry the, the, uh, thank you for the pity laugh. I appreciate it. <laughs> Lastly, make sure that you label all images on, uh, <clears throat> because anytime anything pops up, depending upon the internet speed that you're going to have, sometimes it's going to pop up a little slower than somewhere else, especially if you're using data. So having a short description of what you're, your, um, what you're showing them will at least whet the appetite. This happens to me all the time when I look at something and I go, yep, yeah, uh-huh, it's not loading. Did I do something wrong? Did they do so? Oh, there it is. So that three to four second time can be removed just by labeling your images on your website. I've talked a lot about bad things, and I've talked a lot about scary things when it comes to digital marketing so far. That's because I really want to start today by encouraging you to be a lot more aggressive in how you are pursuing opportunities and remind you of this what you do have and what your competitive advantage is is incredibly powerful you have the opportunity to create loyal happy customers who are going to know you by name yes sir did i do it again close to it okay jeez I have happy feet today. <laughs> you can give them that excellent experience. If somebody has a really excellent Diet Coke and they go on Diet Coke's Facebook page and write about how wonderfully refreshing it was today, now it really just made their day. Do you think Diet Coke really cares? No, because they're awash in an ocean of that. They've got that kind of thing happening all the time. On, on their social channels. So they don't have the opportunity to connect with people on a one-to-one -one basis. They don't have the opportunity to take advantage of the great experiences that they might offer. And here's the key. You do have interesting, you do have important things to say. All of you are experts in what you do for a living. I know this to be true because somewhere in this world there is somebody who has made the decision that you are so good at what you do they will give you money to do it for them. So you do know what you're doing. You do have important things to share. Question of what, we'll talk about right now. <clears throat> and this is really the $64,000 Minnesotan question. What do I say? Or to paraphrase it a little differently, do people really care what I had for breakfast this morning? I had some sort of quinoa and vegetable thing that my wife made me. It was terrible. I went to Perkins after. Don't tell her. 50% <laughs> of the time and 50% of your efforts should be spending on engagement activities. Getting people to like your opportunities, things that you share online, uh, comment back, uh, be entertaining. This might sound trite and it might sound silly, but never underestimate the beauty and the power of a really cute cat video, especially on a Friday. Share images, share videos. This is a great place to share the company culture that you have. Share people having fun and, uh, in your workspace. If you go on the BusyWeb uh, Facebook page, I have to share my office with somebody else right now because we've hired so many people in the last year. And so um, she and I hate sharing an office together, so we do terrible things to each other while we're, while we're trying to work. So if you go on our Facebook page, you'll see a video of uh, me and this other person working dutifully at our desks while um, I was trying to get her to leave. So I was playing pan flute music really, really loudly. Man, do you guys really like pan flute music? <laughs> Zamphir, master of the pan flute. It's, it's really a gorgeous. It's really, we do need a bigger office, but we, we, we're, we'll, get that, we'll get there eventually. It's funny. It's benign. It's not, it, it, it's not really the end of the world. It's not really that offensive unless you had to listen to eight hours of pan flute music like I did. So it's interesting. My favorite cat video right now is the one where there's a lady in San Diego who has a Roomba, and the cat likes to ride on the Roomba. 
So she dresses him up in little outfits, like little sharks and little pirate outfits. It's awesome. You should check it out. Next, you want to be useful and informative. This is where your expertise comes in. You're showing thought leadership. You're showing how you demonstrate why you are as good as you are in what you do. You're sharing new industry in insight. You're sharing trends, hints and tips, curated content. What is curated content? Well, original content everybody should know. Curated content is something that we find somewhere else and we share with the people that we work with. Think of it like a museum. The director of the museum, doesn't, it, there isn't a guy in the back of all the paintings, right? They're curating art to share with other people. That's what you're going to want to do. So if you find things that you find are interesting, if you find things that you think are relevant, 30% of the time that's what you should be sharing online and on your website. Last, you want to be sharing about your business. And you want to do it through effective calls to action, of which I'm going to talk about that in a second. All of you probably have lived here for a while. You're familiar with the com local company called Wilson's Leather, right? They've been going out of business for 22, 23 years now. So seeing that going out of business massive sales sign that we've all seen all the time isn't really going to get us excited about going in the door. So it has to be effective. And it, it, secondly, it also has to be something that's fairly benign and easy for people to do. You're never going to get somebody to give you $10,000 based on how great your Facebook post is. Let me ask you this. How many times have you ever gone to like a home show or like the sportsman show on uh, like a Friday? Not on the weekend, on a Friday, right? There's nobody really there, right? And what you'll see is you'll just see rows and rows and rows of salespeople who are just ready to go, right? And they've got chip clips, pens. And all you want to do is go, please don't sell to me. Please don't sell to me. Don't look, at him. don't look at him. Suddenly, the ceiling is the most fascinating thing you've ever seen. That's because in our heart, we understand we just don't want to be bothered right now. Similarly, your customers have that same feeling. If you club them over the head, like a salesperson at a trade show, what you do want to do is get them to start saying yes to you, but in small ways through calls to action. What do I mean by that? It's small things, not, can, you know, the, the $10,000 question is over here, right? That's the big ask. But before that, it's, will you click here and read more information? Will you go to my website and poke around? Will you then fill out a form and tell me that you're interested? Then will you look at a proposal to see how I can help you? Okay, now can we have a big ask? We want to start by asking small things. That's what our marketing does. So what is a great call to action? It's clear and simple direction. This is funny. If you can't read this in the back, it says uh, it, somebody wrote right on next to the merge left. You want to use graphics and text. Again, we want to have a redundancy in how we're asking people to communicate with us. If we are having a great call to action on our website or even on anything, we want to make sure that it's at the top and at the bottom. And some examples of that are buy, buy this now or call today or something as simple as I need help. Some of the more benign ones are click here, read more, share this. Asking somebody to share is a small little thing. If I've made your life just this much better, can you take this much amount of time to make somebody else's life better? That's what you're really asking. So how do you write for the web? It's unique, it's a little different, and a little scary. So here are the tips that I would suggest for you. Number one, most importantly, if you're going to take anything away from my time with you today, realize that you need to write for what your customers think, or think is interesting and relevant, not what you think that they think is interesting and relevant. What do you do for your customers? That's where you start. What do you do better than everyone else in your industry? And then think about your customer. 
Are they old? Are they young? Are they poor? Are they not so poor? How are they finding you? And lastly, here's the fun thing that you, that another takeaway. Turn all of your frequently asked questions into content. Have every single one of those people that are asking you the same questions on a daily basis, start writing posts about that. Because again, people are going to look for a reason not to buy from you. So if you give them the answers to the questions that are going to pop up in their head before they even get to you, then suddenly they've run out of reasons not to buy. And now we have to start on, on the good reasons to buy. So, how am I doing on time? Not that much time? Two minutes? All right. So, I'm going to... Sorry, I got excited. Uh, when you create a marketing goal, it's important to do two things. Number one, create a goal that actually is tangible and workable. And secondly, give yourself a timetable to really determine whether or not you're successful. I would like to double my business by the end of the month. It is the 27th of the month. Is that a realistic goal? No. That's, a, that's setting me up for failure. So when you are looking at general goals, you can make them sort of general like this, but make sure that you get a specific timetable that goes along with them. And how do you know if it's a good marketing objective? Ask three things. Number one, is this going to help my business grow? If it's not, if you can't put a number on it, it is not going to help your business grow. Second, is this objective obtainable? Remember, I can't double my business by the end of the month unless I had you know, one unit and I want to sell the two. And then finally, how am I going to measure my progress towards it? Everything we do as small business owners is going to be measured. Otherwise, we have no idea if our money is being spent wisely. And especially when it comes to gaining new customer trust and gaining new customers. So here are the four things that digitally break down into what people can use mobile for. So getting found is one. That's things like mobile responsive, SEO, social, directory listings. Next pillar is engaging and nurturing relationships. That's doing the engagement marketing thing that we talked just very briefly about. Next are campaigns that drive action. Those are things like offers, promotions, special events, and then finally analytics and decision making are going to tell you, you're going to get reports that are going to tell you how you did. Analytics can help you make decisions on what to do next. Yeah, everybody got pictures? It is not in the newspaper, but if you give me a card, I'll be more than happy to share it with you later. So how do I wrap this up quickly? First of all, start where you are. Figure out where your customers are. If your customers aren't on Instagram, then don't use Instagram. <coughs> Chances are good they are all, they're all will have mobile uh, email marketing. They'll all be able to look at you at a website, and chances are good they'll all have a Facebook page. So that's where you want to start. Grow from there into other things, and then start growing into more and more things. But to start with, start with that hub of the wheel, which is your website. And then branch out into other things. Next, segment any email list that you might have into customers and prospects, and even deeper into other things. The value for doing this is that you get to deliver the right content to the right people. You're never going to be presenting something to somebody who doesn't yeah. actu isn't actually interested in it. Next, review your content all the time and any headers to anything that you post or share online. Here's the fun rule that I have for this. You have two seconds and the first two words of anything you write to get somebody to do something today. The 2 2, two principle. Two seconds, two words to get somebody to do something today. Which is funny because I had two minutes. <coughs> Use that 50, 30, 20 rule for content. I'd also encourage you to build an editorial calendar so you know what's going to be said when, so you can be doing what's important to you, which should be getting out and selling product and creating new and developing re relationships. 
Make sure that the content, again, I stress, can't stress this enough, is relevant and interesting to your clients, not to you. So things like what's new for you, what advice people have been asking for, what are the questions that they're asking for, what content can you find that they might not have access to. One last thing before I go, how much is too much content to share? Well, I, everybody has that friend who spends way too much time on social media, right? You open up your phone and you look at it and you've got 12 unread things from that one person. That person isn't doing what you need to be doing, which is selling. They're posting funny cat videos. One quick cute cat video is good, more than that is too much. So remember, less is more. So make sure that you're focusing your efforts to be used appropriately. And I'll skip this. So uh, let me skip ahead to questions. I realize I've gone at a breakneck pace. I clearly went too much. We can do questions afterwards. And we'll be Got it. So after it's all over, come on back. Perfect. So uh, one more thing before I go. I do have a couple of tools that I can give you access to to really understand where you are right now so that if, as we're talking today about getting more aggressive with your sales strategies and trying to land more sales, I can help you at least with a digital baseline of what, where you're sitting and how to grow and where to, where to go from here. So thank you uh, for listening and laughing somewhat politely. So, and uh, I'm sorry about the issue with the projector. So. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.